Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2116 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Today we continue with our ongoing series of messages that I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This message is week three on a five-week series titled, Becoming a Radical Disciple. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. All right, as they're getting settled back in, do you welcome everyone once again to Putnam this morning. As we look at our third message in the series on becoming radical disciples. This week we're going to look at maturity and creation care, which Sue touched on. And my purpose in this series is to consider the eight character traits of a Christian discipleship that are often neglected but should be taken seriously as believers. In the past two weeks, we looked at nonconformity, not to conform to the world, and Christ-likeness, what it means to be like Christ. And today we'll focus, as I mentioned, on maturity and creation care. So let's first look at maturity. And if I were to summarize the Christian scene in the world today, or if you were to summarize it, what would your answer be? Well, it's somewhat difficult to know with certainty. I would sum it up in three words. Growth without depth. There's no doubt that the church is seeing phenomenal growth in many parts of the world, including even our Western cultures, although sometimes it's hard to see. The statistics for church growth are tremendous. And it may not look the same church that we looked at 100 years ago or 50 years ago. We might not see that same structure of church. But the number of people that are coming to know the Lord is growing at a very rapid pace. An explosion would not be too dramatic a word to, des- word to describe it. And this is primarily due to the technology of our age. Now we can be muse the technology and say, well, it's not good in certain cases. And as with anything, it can be used for good or bad. But technology, as far as spreading the gospel, is causing explosive growth throughout the world. And this is an exciting time to be alive as citizens of God's kingdom. Sometimes we don't always see this picture, but it's a really exciting time to be alive. For example, the church in both China and India has seen over a hundredfold growth since the last half of the 20th century. And there's more people on an individual Sunday going to church or worshiping together as believers in China alone than all of Western Europe. It's a phenomenal growth. And while persecution has driven much of that underground, it's actually strengthening God's kingdom and has throughout the ages, anytime the church has suffered persecution, it not only strengthens it, but it causes it to grow even more. Now, I use both Bible.com and Bible Gateway on my phone and on my computer, and these are just two tools that you can access via the internet now and they've experienced tremendous growth of people that are using those applications around the world. Nothing has been seen like it. The downloads and the people that are using it on a daily basis is tremendous. Never have we ever seen the gospel and the Bible so prevalent to the masses as we have today. It's phenomenal. Anyone that has any type of internet connection has access to free or very inexpensive biblical materials, unlike any time in the past. For many years, Paul and I are both involved with podcasting, and I've had one for six years now. It's just a short five-minute, five-day-a-week one, and it focuses on biblical wisdom and legacy building. I have mine in the spiritual and religious category, that category alone is by far the largest podcasting category with over 8 million different podcasts. And the majority of those are Christian-oriented podcasts. The American Bible Society in 2021, February of this year, showed that 71% of Americans 
read their Bible on a regular basis. And I know these are a lot of stats. And to make a long story short, the kingdom of God is expanding rapidly. And when Christ returns a second time, it'll be to establish a worldwide Eden, to expand it beyond the garden to the entire world. And with all the negative news that we hear and see on TV or hear on our radios or online, it's nice to have some good news that we can rally behind. But while this good news is great, we have a perspective that we need to grasp today. And this is one of the eight character traits of becoming a radical disciple, and that is maturity. Anytime you have a rapid growth in the church, whether it was during the first century or today, you'll see a lot of numeric growth, but you won't see the corresponding spiritual growth or depth of growth within those believers. So we see superficial disciples everywhere. And it's a massive problem when it comes to those people living with a lack of godliness or integrity. Now, the church universal needs a solid biblical and theological foundation of its own, a godly or biblical worldview that we can see the world through. Because of this rapid growth, we do see immature disciples, and that's what we want to talk about maturity today. And the reason we see immature disciples is not necessarily a fault of their own. We don't see enough citizens of God's kingdom Christians who have been Christians a long time, going in depth and learning God's word and then sharing it with other people. And that's what the call to radical discipleship is. And the lack of radical disciples is not anything new. In the first century, when Paul was going from town to town setting up churches, his biggest problem was that the disciples were just not mature. And he wrote in the letter to the Corinthian church, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, Paul wrote these words. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you as you belong to the world, as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you milk, not solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready. For you are controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove that you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? And because of this, in the church with immature believers, Paul knew he had to teach them how to become mature in the faith. And that's what I hope for here at Putnam and other churches throughout our country and throughout the world. That we together can learn how to be mature in the Christian faith. Paul had to teach them and us how to become radical disciples. And our core verses this week is Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. And this is page 1832 in the Pew Bible. And it reads, So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect or mature, in their relationship with Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Now, when Paul indicated he wanted to present the church in Colossians as perfect, the word perfect here is the Greek adjective teleos, which occurs 19 times in the New Testament. And whether it's translated perfect as it is in New Living Translation or mature as it is in the New International Version, depends on its context, but it rarely means perfect in what we sense, and at least in my mind, I sense as perfect without flaws. That's not what it means here. Perfect, it's meaning the maturity between what an adult would be compared to what a child would be. A child is immature because they are children. An adult should be mature because they've grown and accepted responsibility and have matured themselves. And that's what this word teleos means, is to be mature in our faith. Now, to grasp the full significance of Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, I want to put it into a courtroom scene. And this verse is in the witness stand. 
And we want to apply it with questions. We want to probe it on why we need to be mature. And the first essential question to ask concerns the nature of maturity. What is Christian maturity? The fact that maturity is rather hard to pin down. Most of us suffer from lingering immaturities. Anyone here that doesn't suffer from immaturities in their lives, no matter whether you're 10 or 95? We all suffer from lingering immaturities, and even grown adults, there's still that little child hiding within us, and at times it bursts out in fits of rage. It bursts out in saying things that just aren't right. It bursts out in becoming emotional at the inappropriate times when we should be mature. And this is explained in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. We don't for sure know who wrote Hebrews, but this passage here is very similar to the passage that Paul wrote in Corinthians. It explains the way. It says, there's so much more we would like to say about this, but it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and you don't seem to listen. You have been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again about the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature and those who, through training, have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. I brought my Granny and Gramps bag this morning. This is our treat bags when we take the grandkids out. And one of the things, when the grandkids are very young, they might have to have some milk because they can't handle solid food. Now, I looked for a baby bottle in our house, but I've, evidently we've finally gotten rid of all the baby bottles. So this is as close as I can come, a sippy cup with milk in it. And this milk shows that the younger grandchildren or our own children are not equipped to handle solid food yet. So we give them the milk and we give them it in the cup where they won't spill it all over themselves. But we as adults, what would be better than a nice steak, grilled to perfection, seasoned perfectly, and as we chew on that steak and smell it, we just know how delicious that steak is. But can a baby without teeth eat a steak? No. You have to be mature. You have to have grown up to be able to handle the solid food. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. You should have been Christians long enough where you should be eating steak. But I still have to give you milk because you're not mature enough to handle the solid food. And this as a church, both me personally and we as a church and all churches need to get to the point where we're eating solid food. If we remain on the milk, we're not maturing as we should as believers. And this is what the scripture is telling us. And one of the character traits of becoming a radical disciple is to become mature, to be able to handle a juicy steak from God's word. And besides that, there's different types of maturity. There's physical maturity with having a healthy, grown body that's physically strong, unlike a baby who can barely walk or crawl. There's intellectual maturity of having trained our mind with a coherent biblical worldview. When we see the news headlines, we can sort that out through the Bible and say, that just doesn't make sense according to Scripture. That's not something I want to be involved with. There's a moral maturity that refers to people who have trained themselves to distinguish between good and right, as Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 told us. There's an emotional maturity of having a balanced personality and being able to establish relationships and assume responsibility. One of the traits of a child is they get in spats with each other and argue and fight and don't want to share. That's a sign of a childish behavior. But how many adults have not grown beyond that? And that's become mature. We become responsible and we handle relationships properly. 
and maturely. And above all, there's a spiritual maturity. And what is that? Let's go back and ask our witness in the witness stand. What is spiritual maturity? And the apostle Paul calls maturity as being in Christ. That is having a mature relationship with Christ is spiritual maturity. Now, Paul's most common way of defining Christians is to say that the men and women were in Christ. And it doesn't mean like if you had clothes and you put them in a closet or a wardrobe. It doesn't mean something contained in that or in this toolbox where I have a set of tools that are contained in this toolbox. But Paul's not referring to this type of being in something. Paul's referring to more of a, I don't see a plant here today, but a tree. Think of the one of the trees outside where it has the trunk and then it has branches hanging out on it. Where do the branches receive its nourishment from? From the main trunk whose roots bring up the nutrients. Christ is the trunk and we are the branches of that tree. We receive our nutrients through the body of Christ and that's to say that we're vitally and organically related to him. And that's what it means to be in Christ, that we're drawing our strength from Christ. In this sense, we ought to be mature and have mature relationships with Christ in which we worship, we trust, we love, and obey. So the next question we want to ask our witness in the witness stand is, how does a Christian become mature? In our text, gives us the plain answer. Consider the basic skeleton of verse 28. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that God has given us. To be mature is to have a mature relationship with Christ in which we worship, we love, we trust, and obey. To get a, vi a clear vision of Christ, it's like me without glasses, I can tell you guys are people out there, but they're just they're a bit fuzzy, I must admit. So to be, have a clear vision with Christ, I need to put on my glasses so I can see you clearly as you are and not fuzzy. And that is what it means to be a mature Christian, is to put on your glasses to see the vision through Christ. So we want to develop a true Christian maturity. We need to be fresh and authentic in our vision of who Christ is. One of the most distinct passages of Christ is the whole new, in the whole New Testament is that found in earlier in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And to be a radical disciple, to be mature in your understanding of Jesus Christ, listen as I read this passage because it describes what we are to be when we're on, in Christ and have a proper vision, putting on our glasses to properly see Christ this passage describes it. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and everything on earth. He made the things that we can see, such as our physical earth, and the things that we cannot see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Now we see in our news, in our world today, various prime ministers and kings of countries and presidents, but that same structure is in the heavenly realms through thrones and kingdoms and dominions and powers that we have no clue what they are, but Christ created them just as he created us. We like to think of that as angels that fl fly around there's so much more to the unseen realm than most of us have and can grasp. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ also is the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all, who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything, and God is all fullness, was pleased to live in Christ, and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means Christ's blood of the cross. 
When we get that vision of Christ, of who he is, he was before everything, he created everything, he has dominion above the heavenly realms and to us here on earth. He has a double supremacy. He is the head of the universe and the head of the church. He is Lord of both creations. And considering this, we see a dual responsibility of becoming radical disciples. A maturity in Christ is both the goal for ourselves and for us to minister to others to help them become mature. So then, may God give us such a clear and full vision of Jesus Christ that we may grow in maturity ourselves, and secondly, that our faithful proclamation of Christ in his fullness. And the second attribute I want to go over today, I'll go over quickly. It's about creation care. We're mature believers. So what is our relationship to the earth? And I know I've been brought up in, in the household where we think there's extremists out there that want to do everything to shut down any type of industry in the world. But there's also extremists on the other side who will exploit the earth. So considering our character traits on becoming a radical disciple, we don't want to go to either extreme. We don't want to be, and I'll just use these terms because they're popular in today, the Green New Earth deals, the Green Deal, which wants to shut down everything in production and spare the earth because climate change is going to destroy us all in 10 years. That was true back in the 70s when I was in high school, except then it was going to be um, the Ice Age, New Ice Age. Now it's global warming. And I'm not minimizing that because humans do impact climate. There's no way for it not to. But we need to stay away from those extremes. We're not to worship the creation, but the creator. And if you see the lives of those on either end of the spectrum, what are they after? Power and profits. Power and profits. Whether they want to spare the earth from this calamity or destroy the earth by exploiting its resources, it boils down to power and profit on both ends of the spectrum. And we have to realize that as believers, but our relationship with creation is not either one of those. Our relationship with creation is based on our relationship with God. God has established his relationship with us in the Garden of Eden, and we have a relationship between each other like Adam and Eve did. And we had creation that God put us to tend over. Therefore, it stands to reason that God has a plan for the restoration of the earth. Now, some Bible teachers will say, well, God's going to destroy the heavens and the earth in the end of days. And there's some scripture you could pull out and say, yeah, he's going to destroy it. But if you really dig into those scriptures, you realize that God's talking about restoring the heaven and the earth in the end days. When his kingdom becomes a full reality, he's going to restore what he began in the Garden of Eden. It broke down in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. God isolated them and kicked them out of the garden. It separated man from woman that were supposed to be together. They blamed each other, and God cursed creation. But why I say that I think it's going to be a restoration of the heavens and the earth is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. And the Apostle Paul wrote, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will be joined to God's children in a glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that creation is gro groaning with the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. We believers are also grown, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us that is a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from the sin and suffering. Oh, don't we do that? Long for our bodies to be released. 
from that sin and suffering, but we too wait for eager hope for the day when God will give us full rights as adopted children, including new bodies that he had promised us, just like Christ's resurrected body was the form and they could recognize him as Christ. It had attributes to it, such as moving from one spot to another instantly or going through walls that we don't have in our physical body. And those are the new bodies, the restored bodies that we look forward to. And the earth will be restored to the new Eden, except it will be a global Eden instead of just a garden in the Middle East. For the Lord God placed man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. So how then should we relate to the earth? If we remember the created, it was created by God and then delegated to us to take care of. If you remember back in the Sermon on the Mount, I said everything that we own, we're really just stewards to maintain that while we're on earth. Because as soon as we die, we don't own it anymore. We don't possess it. It's not ours to take care of anymore. So that at best, we're caretakers of what God has given us. And part of that is the entire world. The creation that he's made for us, we're caretakers to take good care of it, but to use it for its purpose. We have to avoid the deification of creation and we have to avoid the destruction of creation. Avoid those two extremes. We're to tend and watch over it. The command is a cultural mandate. For God has given us this world and it's for us to take care of properly. We're not only to conserve the environment, but to develop, develop its resources which God has given us for the good of all mankind. And whether you like fossil fuels or not, our world would not be what it is today without them. Now, I think that we need to manage them properly and not exploit the world. But God has given us those resources for this period of time. And technology will allow us to create other types of resources we know nothing about now. It's a noble calling to cooperate with God to fulfill his purpose and to transform the created order for the pleasure and profit of all people. Not to a few extremists over here who fly around in their private jets complaining about the climate change or the barons over here who don't give a whip about whether they destroy the world as long as they get the resources that they're after. We have to be mature as believers and concentrate on taking care of what God's given us for the good and the profit of all people. Our work expresses our worship and that we still care for the creation and that we reflect our love for the creator by caring for the creation that he's given to us. What can a radical disciple do to care for the creation? First, we must be aware of it and our responsibility. We must be aware that God has given it to us for, for a delegation to take care of because we are responsible before him. We've done so in many other areas of life, such as in the past, the medicines that we've created, and whether you like the current vaccines or not, we know that the medicines of today are helping us to live much longer, healthier lives. We've also have battled against ignorance by allowing everyday common people to have all the resources they need to learn. We've battled against slavery and other forms of brutality and exploitation. exploitation. And accordingly, as Christians, we've taken up the causes of widows and orphans and refugees and prisoners and the hungry and doing our best to eliminate poverty in our world. And that's the same attitude that we're to have with God's creation. We don't are not to abuse the world, but we're to use it as God's given responsibility to use it wisely. God intends our care of the creation is to be reflected on our love for the Creator. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14, Moses wrote, Look, the highest heavens and earth and everything in it belongs to the Lord your God. It's all God's. We're responsible to take care of it. 
And as I mentioned, some Christian circles might say, well, the Lord, Lord's going to destroy the heavens and the earth, so we don't really have to care. But what if it's the other way? As I mentioned, that when Christ returns to earth, is to restore the Garden of Eden worldwide. Can we stand before him and say, well, I didn't know you weren't going to destroy it, so I didn't care. Now we're to take care of what God's given us responsibly for the good of all mankind so that we all can benefit and profit from it. So today we've investigated radical discipleships on becoming mature and taking care of God's creation. And they dovetail together, and that's why I brought them together in today's message. Because if we're mature, we're going to be responsible also to take care of God's creation. So let me ask you this question for you to ponder this week. What will you do this week and from this point onward to be more mature as a believer, to help others to mature as believers, and to take care of that God's good earth that he's given to all of us? And during this series on becoming a radical disciple, I ask you to take time each week to read Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And I hope that you'll do this during each week. And it says, don't, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Next week, we'll go on to two more character traits of simplicity and balance. How to live a, a simple life, but a balanced life. And that's what we want to do as we become radical disciples. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you so much for your love, your goodness, your mercy to us. Help us to mature ourselves, to eat the solid word from your word, Father to learn how to mature and to help others to mature, to take care of your creation that you've blessed us so richly with. Even if it's cursed, Father, it's magnificent in its cursed state. We can't yet imagine what it'll be like when you release this curse from us and the world to be in its glorious state, Father. We just praise you that we can have this to look forward to. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.